what is it that we would uh, like to emerge from this conference uh, as a gathering? Because this is a, a galactic gathering. Uh, we come from all over the world, and I'm sure if we went through the room here, um, we would hear how people would identify with different star groups. Ted, how much more time? Uh, we're good. We're rolling, uh, okay, all right. Um, so what, what I want to do is to just emphasize that this is a gathering, and in this gathering we have people from all the parts of the world, um, and each person has a particular star lineage. We've had presenters talk about star seeds, uh, we, we're familiar with the ideas of walk-ins and ETs among us. But everyone that is in this room in some way is associated with a particular star group, whether it's Sirius, like uh, our friend Dolphin Under, whether it's... Or is it Pleiades? I get confused. It's one or the other, the Sirius, the Pleiades. Uh, and, or the Pleiades or whatever star system. It's just everyone in this gathering has a linkage. So we are a council. We are a council. And, and so the more we can merge our th aspirations, our thoughts on a common, common vision, um, we give the assent to that vision being created, not only by our own collective energies, the networks we're associated with, but also by the, the star visitors or the ET civilizations that we're associated with. So maybe, again, we can just kind of like do a little breathing exercise just to set the scene for uh, how we can be anchors for this energy coming in. So again, maybe we all just kind of relax. And we'll just do a very quick exercise, 60 seconds. Just relax. Take a few deep breaths. And just reflect a little bit about what has transpired at this conference. Think about what happened during the first day. We had Michael Cremo presenting. Then we had Elizabeth Rauscher. And then we had Angelica Whitecliffe finishing the day. And with those three presenters, an energy was built up in terms of our linkage to the star visitors, our linkage to the indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples, and our linkage to the future, what we can become as a species. So just open yourself up to being conduits for this energy of the future evolution of the human species. If we are to be embodiments of these ideals of a superman, superwoman, a highly evolved representative of Gaia, let's open ourselves up to this possibility. And let's now think about the presentations that occurred on Saturday. We had Dr. Mark Macy linking us with the spirit world. Then we had Luis Fernando connecting us with the energies of the Venusians, those from Ganymede, those from the inner earth. Just connect with those energies for a moment.
then we had David Wilcock taking us on a tour of our past and our future. We had the morning meditations with Shalaya both on Saturday and Sunday. We had Victoria Lillenquist that started everything for us on Saturday. So let's bring her energies back into this exercise. This morning we began with Joan Ocean, connecting us with the energies of the dolphins, the whales, our cosmic brethren. Paula Harris, connecting us with contactees from Italy connecting us with star beings from Clarion. And so all of this, all of these presentations build up an image of the future, of where we're going as a species and where this gathering can help direct energies. So just now for 30 seconds, Visualize where, what kind of world you would like to emerge based on all of you've heard and based on your own experiences. Just envisage for 30 seconds the kind of world you would like. Well, thank you for bringing back those energies that we've been introduced to during this conference. And we're going to continue that journey because we are going to be introduced now to another set of energies, a very powerful set of energies from the constellation of Andromeda. I think it's a great honour for any individual to be picked by a set of extraterrestrials as their representatives and such people really need to be honoured because it's not an easy job. In our society, uh, people who have had these direct encounters have had tremendous challenges to overcome, obstacles thrown their way that have had a profoundly uh, disturbing effect on families, careers, lives. So it's not easy to be a representative of a of a race of beings who have a positive message about our future. And what we're going to hear now for the next hour and a half is someone talking to us about a race of extraterrestrials who do have a very positive image for us in terms of where we're going, the potential, the incredible potential we have, the diversity of genetics and experiences that we have acquired over, th over millennia of experiences. He's going to be introducing us to a set of extraterrestrials who really do have firmly conveyed to him their image or their vision of what we hold, what we can create, what we are capable of achieving. And so our next speaker, Alex Collier, is someone who has taken on this, this job, this challenge, with great courage, great integrity, and has maintained that despite the tremendous challenges that have come his way. 
and he has a message to share. A message that he has not been in the American public uh, disseminating for six years now. His last public appearance in the United States was in 2002. So it's been six years that he took time off so that he could just give himself some, a time out because, as I said, the type of attacks, challenges that contactees face are incredible, uh, very uh, disturbing uh, in all, all aspects. And so Alex has now come back to give us again his message, his experiences with the Andromedans and he has something that I think is as relevant today as it was back in 1990, almost 20 years ago when he first began to speak. And maybe now we are more ready for that message as opposed to when he first came out courageously bringing forward this message of hope and inspiration and maybe now we are part of that group, that gathering, that can help realise this vision. So without further ado, I introduce Alex Collier. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Hello. Hello. There we go. <clears throat> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it, it is a real honor for me to be here uh, to share the stage with so many awesome speakers. Yes, I took a hiatus, um, and a well-deserved hiatus. Uh, um, I started talking about this in the early 1990s, and uh, very few people were ready to hear about it. And I was very passionate about it, and I kept bucking the system, kept bucking the system, only to get pushed back and pushed back. And uh, there comes a point where you know that you just have to let go. You know it in relationships, you know it in a, a career, uh, sometimes you even know it with yourself or with members of your family. You just have to just stop pushing and just let go. And that's what I had to do. And in that process of letting go, um, I evolved a lot, and that needed to happen. I needed to grow. It doesn't seem like it, but um, for 40 years, I uh, have had a relationship with human beings from the constellation of Andromeda. It started when I was eight years old, and I only have an hour and a half, so I just want to kind of skim through this, because all the information or most of the information that you want is available for free on the internet. Um, and it is for free. It, I don't own the material. I, I just volunteered to deliver the message. Um, they're an incredible race. Now, they're not gods. Okay, in, in, in the metaphysical community, in the UFO community, the New Age community, it's dangerous to worship um, your myths and your idols because when you do that, you don't necessarily see their faults. And everybody has faults. Uh, they are a fifth dimensional race. They are technologically 10,000 years more advanced than us and spiritually probably closer to 50,000. But they still have their own issues, okay, with their own society. They're still evolving. They're still trying to make their way and find out what is the path. And each one of them has their own path because they're individuals, just like we are. So regardless of who makes first contact, who shows up afterwards, whoever's in this room, the bottom line is this. We are all at different stages of evolution, but no one is better than any other. All right? No one is. And don't ever accept that. The Andromedans first came here because something happens in the future. And uh, there's a, a very negative imbalance that occurs in their future. And in tracing it back, they traced it back to our solar system. I don't know if that is still a probability now. 
um, we are getting all kinds of help and intervention from many different races. And the reason for that is, is fascinating, to be perfectly honest with you. And it, it's probably going to take a little while for it to sit with you, but, but it, it's important that, you, that, that I do the best that I can to share this. It is the Andromedan perspective that all of us on this planet are genetic royalty. That inside each one of us, we hold the combined DNA of 22 different extraterrestrial races. Now, all of the speakers have touched upon some of these things over the weekend, and I've sat in the audience with you, and like, you know, bells would go off. Bells would go off all the time. Uh, Dr. Uh, Cremo made reference to here's physicality, but something brings it to life. Something creates the DNA. Okay, that's obviously spirit. It's soul. Um, David Wilcock talked about the same thing of spirit, uh, higher dimensional realms, higher entities coming in and creating a template um, over life. All of these things are a possibility because God is so incredibly creative. There is no limit to the creativity of the creator or to us. Now, the Andromedan perspective, and I'm just going to get right into this and then I'll share some stories because I, I want you to sit with this. The Andromedan perspective is, is that many of us have already been through this cycle of evolution on a spiritual level. It is their perspective, and this is information that they have received from teachers that they have that are on ninth density is that on the 11th density, there is a race of beings called the Patal. They're also known as the founders who created the wormholes and many other things, okay, in our known universe. The Vidya, it's a holograph. Those who created our holograph, the original ones who created our holograph. Apparently, this, the spiritual evolution of our universe got stuck. Somehow it got stuck. And it was interesting that Michael Wilcock talked about, uh, David Wilcock talked about that last night as well. It is their perspective that this group of Patal left eternity to fall back into the concept of time. And that many civilizations, approximately 21 civilizations, in third density which are going through the same process we're going through, Patal are on all of those planets. Okay? So now you have highly spiritually evolved beings who came in to time, choosing to forget who they were, stepping into genetic royalty physicality. Now within that physicality and that genetic makeup that we have, we also have the racial memories of these races. Now, that's profound because when you take a look at the idea that many of these different races come from a completely different environments, completely different living habitats and ecosystems, which we'll talk about, there truly is absolutely no limit to what we are and what we can do. The question no longer is, and I agree absolutely 100% with Paula on this. It isn't, are we alone? Whew, that question's done. The question is, what do we want? That's the question. Who do you want to be? It's not who you were, who do you want to be? What do you want? In what direction do you want to create? What do you want to create? Do we create it together? Or do we stand as individuals? That's really where humanity is. We're going to get all the help in the world, but they are not going to do the work for us. They're just not. They can't. We will never permanently, spiritually evolve third density into fourth and to fifth if they do the work for us. And that does not mean, and that, that literally means, not everybody's going to graduate on this planet. Okay? But that's okay. We're all soul. We're all spirit. People start over all the time. Okay? 
The idea here is who wants to? Okay? You all have what it takes. And I'm not only addressing you, I'm also addressing whoever sees this because these DVDs have a life of their own. Okay? Um, the Andromedans are light blue skinned. They have uh, three sexes, androgynous, male and female. Uh, they live in a spiritual community a, uh, where their lifespan is anywhere from an average to an average of 1,900, 1,800 years to 2,300 years. Some of, their, some of their race actually live much longer, but that's the average. Their children go to school to what would be the equivalent of, of our years, 150 to 180 years, where they learn all the sciences, they get all the degrees, and everything that is available as far as knowledge at the moment is taught to them. So when these kids grow up, they are in fact smarter than their parents. And that's called the law of consistency, which is what they practice. All right? They would never, ever consider dumbing down their children so that they could be managed or controlled. Because that's sabotaging the race. Okay? So they have all these sciences, they have all this technology. They travel in arcs, or motherships, we would call them. Uh, the one that I'm the most familiar with, that I spent three months on, is an 800 miles cylindrical sphere that has hundreds of floors. It is much bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. And I have no idea how they do that. I still don't know. But even their scout craft are bigger on the inside than they are on the outside. They have these enormous parks on the inside where they grow all their food. They are fruititarians. Okay? They breathe oxygen like we do. They drink water like we do. But they live off of fruit. And they grow these type of fruits um, on their craft. They have 20, 30, 40 mile parks on virtually every floor. Where, and, and along the sides of the parks is where the folk, where they habitate. There's like apartments all around the circles. And there's wildlife, there's animals, there's birds, uh, things that look like squirrels. There's all these different life forms. They also have a lot of different colors. Because they're fifth density, their color spectrum is, 200 to 21, is 221 colors, where our bandwidth is only 72 here. So it's impossible for me to share with you some of the, the colors that I've seen because we, there's just no... There's just no way. There's no point of reference for me to share that with you here. They have animals that, well, the closest thing they have is something that looks like a squirrel, but it isn't a squirrel. Okay? But it's very clever, and all the animal life is telepathic. It completely interacts with all of the people there. Um, the children are all telepathic. They do not speak. Uh, very few do. Morinay has learned to speak. And that's because of my relationship with him over the last 40 years. He made an effort. Um, OK, I got way ahead of myself, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. I'm a little nervous. Um, my relationship with the Andromedans have been primarily with two beings, a very old gentleman, a sage. Um, his skin has gone pale because of his age. Uh, his name was Phaseus. They don't really use names, they use symbols, but for the benefit of me, because of, of our culture and how we like to label things on the planet, um, his tone, his frequency, his symbol would equate to the word Phaseus. So he was Phaseus. Phaseus was about five, four foot uh, 11, four foot nine uh, tall. Very old. In, in our years, he was 4,300 years old. So he was like a Yoda but very stiff, you know, very, very stiff. Morinet, on the other hand, um, is 2,300 years old. He was very young, very strong. He's seven foot tall, 400 pounds, and he's just perfect. Um, he's loosened up. He's learned to talk. He has a sense of humor. Many of them do, but because they're telepathic, you don't actually hear the jokes. 
<laughs> okay. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and I was very self-conscious in the beginning because sometimes they would look and then they would smile and kind of giggle and, and you know they're talking about you, but you just don't know what it is, you know. You can't even eavesdrop. So uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been an extremely interesting experience. Um, I love them. I, I absolutely love them. They, they are my brothers. They are my family. And the Andromedan people love us because genetically they're connected to us. And they have been extremely worried about us for a long time. Um, there was at one point a council meeting in Andromeda. It's only held there. They don't run it. It's only held there because it's a central point for many star systems in that part of our galaxy to talk about us. And I think it's noteworthy to tell you about this. Um, I was told about this in the late 80s. But they don't have the same kind of time that we do. So I don't know the exact time that this meeting actually occurred. But they only shared it with me in the 80s when I was living in Malibu. There was a meeting to decide what to do here. There was a, a great deal of concern. Um, about intervening to assist us in our evolution because there were outside influences that were doing everything they could to suppress our evolution. And that's a whole other story. Um, a very large contingency, fortunately, thought that it was in not only their best interest, but in our best interest to at least give us the opportunity to make our own choices without being manipulated. A smaller group made the argument, and this was their argument. They don't respect themselves, they don't respect each other, and they don't respect their home. What is their value? We are so busy with our life and going from here to there to here to there, packing up the kids, going to work, paying our bills, doing the grocery shopping, getting gas in the car. We are so busy with our lives that we rarely ever stop to think about what it is that we're really creating. Sometimes something has to happen, like a 9-11, like uh, the, the cyclone that just hit Myanmar, uh, the earthquake that hit China, where we're jolted out of our reality and we're able to take a step back and say, whoa, what are we doing? I share that with you because most of humanity is in that place. You know, their heads down and they're just pushing along, plodding along, trying to survive, trying to do everything that we've been doing and our ancestors have been doing for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. None of that stuff's going to work anymore. Okay? I know you guys already know that. Okay, the old paradigms are crumbling. They're done. It's just a question of time before they completely collapse and fall. And if you're watching that, if you're watching the world, you're beginning to see it. It's all crumbling. One of the things that the Andromedans um, are in awe of us about is our ability to create domains of knowing. So what am I talking about? The idea of human rights the idea of a Bill of Rights, individual liberties, guaranteed rights of a people, how to live and how to be treated. That has not existed on our planet forever. Okay? But we created that. We created the idea of freedom. We created the idea of space travel. We created the idea of free energy. Now, yes, a lot of that is coming, has also come from the outside. But the reality is, the reason it's coming from the outside is because we pulled it here. Us. Okay, as a collective consciousness. We pulled all that to us. We even pulled the ETs here. And they've been here for a very, very long time. Okay, the worshiping of the gods. Hermes and Titan and yada, 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 okay? We did that because we are that powerful. 
we are, we're magnificent. They are absolutely in awe of, of the ability for people to create music, like our musicians here. They're amazed that they can just pull it out of nowhere. Because the Andromedans, they don't do that. As advanced as they are, they can't do that. What they do is as they travel through star systems, they have these holographic cameras that take pictures of stars, constellations, planets, and they all have a, town, a, a tone and a frequency. And what they'll do is they'll record that, and then they will overlay those tones and frequencies, and that's how they create their music. All right? They take the music that the universe creates. We, on the other hand, we create our own. We just pull it out of nowhere. Now, it's the Andromedan perspective that we have all outlived our religions 450 years ago. Um, but you know, everybody's, everybody's looking, um, everybody's trying to find their own way. And hopefully they will all find it in their time. Um, we do have a window, however. And uh, I know that there's a lot of talk of 2012. I honestly do not know what's going to happen. I don't know exactly how it's going to happen. I don't necessarily know that I want to know. Um, this is quite an adventure. And there is really something very profound about living in the moment. Because then you really pay attention. You're not thinking past it. You're really grateful for the moments that you're in right now and really gratified for those moments that you have. Um, because time is really the only currency that we have. It's not money, it's time. There's not a minute you can get back. You can always make another dollar, but there's not a minute once it's gone that you can get back. Um, I wanted to share with you um, the definition of who we are supposed to be or who we're going to become. I've asked this question several times, um, and finally, um, Viseas, after much hemming and hawing, agreed to share it with me, um, who, who, they, who they see us becoming. Um, Is it possible to have just a little light here? Okay. <laughs> You're the man. I have to be more specific. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> um, okay. I wish I knew what I did with it. Um, okay. I asked one, one time in just pure desperation. You know, what's going to happen to us? And, you know, they've had a hard time with some of my passion and, and my emotions. I mean, I'm a Terran, and we use them here. Um, not always responsibly, but we do. So I was just like, you know, what is it that you want me to do, just out of pure frustration? Um, you know, what are we going to, what's going to happen to us? And I just screamed at Viseas. And he just very calmly looked at me and he goes, this is how we foresee who you will all become. Responsible freedom of self-determination, becoming truly self-confident and free to unconditionally be responsible for yourself without being coerced by some other authority. Okay? Um, they've said many, many times, 
who we are already who we need to be. It's just a question of remembering. And um, and in that remembering, it's about letting go of what we would perceive as mistakes, um, of regrets. I had a contact in the 90s, and it was at a particular time in my life where just a lot of things weren't going well. And uh, I didn't see any point in even being here. And I was with them on the ship, and I'm like, okay, I'm already in another reality. I, I just want to stay with you. And that was my request. I just want to stay with you. Don't even bother to take me back. I don't care about anything there. And I literally, with just the clothes on my back, I was ready to, to go. I was done. Unfortunately, they were not going to allow that to happen. <laughs> and um, I was forced to come back. And I'm standing on the ground. And I'm, I'm watching them leave. And I'm crying. I'm like, you know, you're abandoning me. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be here. And uh, Viseus was at the door, and he just very quietly and in his way telepathically said, Alex, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry lifetime after lifetime. And that was a real aha moment, okay? Um, and it was an aha moment Because we make decisions like that without ever thinking about them, really. You know, um, somebody calls us on the phone, hey, I really need to talk to you. I have a situation. And you're like, you know, I've had a crappy day. I can't be bothered with it. And you just don't call them back. Um, or the, the kids want to do something, you know, and you know they really want to do it. And you're just too tired. And you say, no, we're not going to do it. And the decision isn't that you could do it. The decision is that you chose not to do it. Um, and maybe those aren't the best examples, but we all have made choices to withhold love from partners, from family, from ourselves. We've all made those decisions. And uh, those are tough. Those are really, really tough to look at. Um, you know, we've all been there. And being consciously aware of not choosing to withhold love is an amazing feat. And it is not an easy one either. Um, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't remind myself of that. I mean, that was an aha moment that's with me every day now. Um, doesn't always mean that, you know, I always make the best choices or the right choices. Um, I wanted to share also with you something that they have shared regarding time. No, I'm, I'm going to wait on that. Um, on the worship of the isness. Now, one of the first questions that I had for them um, when I was a little boy, th th these, these contacts started when I was eight years old, and I was vacationing in the upper pen northern peninsula of Michigan. Um, my family was living in Illinois at the time, Elk Grove Village, Illinois. And my grandparents owned a cabin up near uh, the Woodstock Crooked Lake area of, of northern Michigan. And uh, we used to go up there every summer. And uh, it, was, it was awesome. It was just an awesome place. And the, uh, the first contact... Um, we had gone out into some fields to, to, we had all the family there. It was a big gathering, all the cousins, and we were on a family picnic. And we went up there to, to we went out to this huge field where the picnic area was, and it was very high grass and acorn trees everywhere, uh, chestnut trees, and we went out to uh, play hide-and-go-seek. Because the grass was tall, a lot of us would just lay down on the grass, and we would just hang out. Well, that's what I did, and it was, you know, mid-afternoon. 
Um, I don't know the exact time because, you know, children don't pay attention to that. But when I, when I came back and I realized that I was on the ground, it was nighttime. But what had happened was I had fallen asleep, and the next thing I remember is I am on this table, and there are two gentlemen standing on either side of me, Viseas and Morinay. Now, what's interesting is that I had an absolute instant recognition of who they were, and I cannot explain it other than it was a soul connection. But you know when you meet somebody, you know you just know them? It was one of those. And they were very, very sensitive. They were very warm. They were very friendly. Um, I didn't feel an, a moment of fear whatsoever. And I remember them helping me sit up, and I'm just looking, and I'm, well, where am I? And Viseya said, well, you are with us. And I said, well, where's that? And he said, well, you are aboard our craft. We have come back to visit you. And at that point, monitors, the, the walls were just like this, right here. Okay, but round circular. There was a light in the room that I simply don't know where it came from because there, there were no light fixtures whatsoever. Um, the table was just some kind of a metal table with a pad on it, except it was a different type of metal. And all of a sudden, monitors start popping out from the walls, like out of nowhere. Turns out that this is their holographic technology, all this instrumentation. And all of these things were showing me pictures and of things of, of going on that were going on inside my body. At one point, Viseas reached under the table, pulled out something which looked like a little yarmulke. Uh, it was metallic that had a, a hole in the center. He placed it on my head. And instantly, a monitor directly in front of me pulled out of the wall and started showing me scenes, like uh, movie clips, except they were scenes from lifetimes. And as I'm watching this, I am having a profound emotional effect watching this. And I know that that's me. I knew that the past lives that they were showing me were me. And it was me in completely different bodies, extraterrestrial bodies, different life forms, male, female, androgynous, and it was me. And I knew it was me. Ladies and gentlemen, it was profound. It was absolutely profound. They told me that they had come back to visit because genetically, or on a soul level, I was part of them. That I had come here 62,000 years ago as an outpost on Earth and got, in, got caught between a skirmish between two other rival extraterrestrial races here and I was killed. So I had been here for a while trying to evolve out of this. Or I made choices to be here. I don't exactly know that. Now I know I can't prove any of this to you, but it's real for me. It's totally real for me. And I share that with you because as you're exercising discernment, those of you who are here just exploring, trying to figure it out, you are soul first. Okay, The physicality is the last part of you. You are soul first. And the soul is far wiser than the body will ever, ever be. And I know that, okay? So that, this, this was very real in Israel for me. Um, on December, in 1993, a color sound frequency started emanating from all the black holes in the known universe. It hap it's, it's happening on all the levels. This is the Andromeda perspective. This color sound frequency was creating a brand new holographic template over the entire density mass of our universe. Now, apparently, within that holograph, there were conscious beings. The A's do not know who they are. 
but those that they're talking to, their mentors from higher uh, evolutions or higher densities, have said that they have the ability to be at their level, this 12th density, and look directly down through all the densities, that they have this ability. It is said that this template is literally pulling all of the dimensions up to another higher frequency. And what we're going through here with shifts, with new dimensional shifts, with higher frequencies, with expanded consciousness, so are the other extraterrestrial races. They're going through the exact same thing as we are, but it's different for them. Okay, they're a much more aware consciousness. They probably have not suppressed any of the technology from their people, so they, they know what's happening. And they are all moving together because of the law of consistency. They are all moving together. They all have the same similar goal, and that's of evolution, okay? Spiritual evolution and moving together as a race, as a family. They're, they're coming back here to try to help mentor us for that because of who we are, whether we're patal or not. Okay, we are genetic royalty. I have absolutely no doubt about that. And that in itself is remarkable, especially when you consider when we've lived on this planet, everything that we've been taught about who we are. Um, you know, religions have punished us profoundly. Science says we're just a pool of chemicals that was created by a mistake. Um, it's just, it's remarkable. Um, but we're none of that. We're absolutely none of that. And my guess is, is that we had this planned all along. Um, we planned this struggle all along to grow, to evolve, to make a statement to the rest of the universe. Um, Okay, um, I want to share, in their words, some of the things that they've shared with me. Um, I'm going to talk about consciousness. The most necessary action for all of your Terran races who are aware is to do what you are capable of to illuminate your degenerated societies. Consciousness is your scale. It always provides balance, which does not ever fail. It speaks to those who listen and tells them what to do and what not to do. Not one, um, to one or all beings who choose to be evolved, the administrators of your government are responsible for professional order, but not your moral codes of order. The key to your happiness, Terrans, is in the hands of your own consciousness. You are per we have perceived that you Terrans have arranged your lives not according to yourselves, but according to others. Your disappointments are due to this fact. This kind of conduct of yours is what is limiting your races. Each one of you is a free soul, a free consciousness. No one is the servant or slave of anyone else, though the hidden ones would trick you to believe otherwise. Mutual, mutual respect is imperative for a healed planet and race. Our help is being extended to you if you so want it. Because of your genetic lineages to our races, we would like to be there with you during your difficult times. Today, your planet and your race destroys itself in ignorance. The goal is to recover the genuine human beings lost with deep within yourselves and try to always be at one with yourself. Um, <laughs> I'm really out of, out of sorts here. Okay, um, I'm going to share this with you. This is from Morinay. 
This is from 1998. He makes reference to December 3rd, 2013. That was the original number that they felt that, or the original date on our calendar that we would actually be moving into uh, fifth density, that date. All of us, regardless of our form or our dimensional growth, live in a boundless consciousness. It does appear that all things seem to revolve and evolve in cycles. Now, after the blindness of 5,725 years, you and your Terra are about to regain yourselves. It will be such an unprecedented change that it will be difficult for many to grasp their own potential. It is the turning point on your world which none of your planet's forefathers were privileged to ever experience. Um, can I have just some light? Please, any light, any light. Yeah, the ceiling light, thank you. <laughs> okay, that's good, thank you. That helps me. Um, in Andromeda, one of the things that they stress is creating a race of leaders. In that leadership, everyone has a responsibility to not only be a leader themselves, but to make a leader of everyone else. And in that, everybody moves together. There may be varying different degrees, but everybody moves together. Um, this is something that they have stressed over and over and over again. Um, they've also stressed being as, as close to nature as possible. You folks here in Hawaii, that's really easy. And you live in an incredible place. Uh, for those of us who live on the mainland or, or in other countries, um, in big cities, it's, it's much more difficult. Um, I want you to know that we're the only planet um, that I'm aware of that uses currency. Okay? Um, in fact, I had an experience where Morinane and Phaseas had asked me to try to explain to them why we used money, or what they refer to as paper with pictures on it. <laughs> so I spent a great deal of time in between contacts putting something together for them. And uh, I had a contact. I was living in Malibu at the time up on Decker Canyon. And I had this opportunity to present this information to them. So as I'm presenting it, I'm going through it. I, have, I had a, a paper with me that I was reading it off and, and had little charts <laughs> that I'd carried in my backpack. And when it was all over, and of course they already knew this information because they've been watching our history, Viseas said, thank you very much. I mean, uh, Morinay said, thank you very much. I, I, I enjoyed it. But <laughs> Viseas just looked at me and he was, just had a very straight face. And he just said, I don't understand. And I said, well, what do you not understand? Now, Phaseus was always telepathic. He never learned to use his vocal cords. He said, I don't understand why you have to live, how, why you have to pay to live on a planet you were born on. Why do you have to pay to live on a planet you were born on? That haunted me for many years that statement um, because you know how do we unravel that you know what do we create in order to to drop that paradigm and how do we create it you know who's who's going to step up and say you know what we have fought wars over money we have fought wars over gold we have fought wars over this and fought wars over that we have nearly destroyed the planet uh, we have destroyed species, we're destroying humanity, um, and it's all over power, wealth, and things like that. You know, how, how do we move from this paradigm to the next paradigm? You know, how do we do it? 
I know that there are a lot of folks trying, making suggestions, talking to people, sharing uh, their perspectives. I know there are a lot of contactees or folks, there are hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands, who have not come forward yet. Um, the extraterrestrial civilizations have given up on the governments of the world, of Earth, a long time ago. Um, the only ones that are actually fully integrating with a lot of the Earth uh, governments, you don't really want to meet anyway. So, um, how do we find our soul again? What does it take to change the essence of a man? Is there a phrase? Is there a mantra? Is there a prayer? Um, is there an event? You know, what does it take to change the essence of a man or a woman? I don't have that answer, but I am asking the question, and I have been for a long time. Um, Many of us, and I'm not necessarily referring to, to the folks in the room here, many of us have completely lost our way. Um, we know a lot of good people who would do anything for us as friends, but they simply don't have a clue. Um, we want them to be aware of the changes that are coming, and you can put all this information in front of them, and they're simply going to just dismiss it because it's too overwhelming to them. You know, you, they have to take it in little bites and little slices. Um, they simply, they just simply don't want to deal with it because they're so overwhelmed just trying to manage a life that already doesn't work, okay? Or they're not already happy with um, because it's, it's all that they know and they're afraid to let it go because they don't have anything else to believe in, just, just what it is that they do every day. So in creating a new domain of knowing and asking the question, what is it that we want? It has to be something that everybody can t take hold of a piece of. Um, for example, every day there are little things that we could do to begin shifting our consciousness. Every day when we get up, the first thing we should do is be grateful that we're alive to see another day and just make that acknowledgement. Spirit, thank you. Always tell your children that you love them every day. Tell them that you're proud of them. Always tell your wife that you love her or your partner that you love her. Always be friendly and cordial at the office, okay? Um, when you hear an ambulance drive by, just say a blessing. Say, I, I bless whoever that's for and that their highest good is what is achieved. Little things like that. When you walk into a room, just say, I bless this room. Little things like that make all the difference. Because it's conscious intent that every day when you do things like that, and that's all, it, and that, that, those things are easy to do, all right? is what you do is you begin to polarize. You begin to magnetize those spaces with your thoughts. And whatever you magnetize and you put out, it will come back. It will be mirrored back to you. That's why Earth is, is boot camp for the soul. It's because that's what it does. It mirrors our shit back to us. You know? And the more shit, the more shit. <laughs> okay? And that's why it's so overwhelming after a while. <laughs> so it's little things it's it you know and 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 i share that because these are things that you know i've had to try to do and and i struggle to remember them every day you know and but but these are little things that i can do um you know i bless my food you bless your coffee what you do is you just get into a space of blessing everything. And it does, in fact, change the frequency. 
It will change the people that you work with. It might take a little bit of a while. Um, but these are simple things. It's just, you know, like the movie The Secret said, it's an attitude of gratitude. Okay? But they're just little things that you can remember to do every day. Um, at lunchtime, go for a walk. Don't sit in your cubicle, but go for a walk. Go outside. When you go to the bathroom, if you work in an office, when you're done, instead of going right back into your office to your cubicle, go downstairs, go outside, loop around the building, and come back in. Just give yourself a break. Just remember where you are. Don't get stuck in just being so in a rut that you forget. Because it's easy. That's, you know, that, that's why we're so stuck on Earth. And, and, you know, the extraterrestrials, the visitations, the psychic phenomena, the paranormal, paranormal phenomena, all of that stuff, ladies and gentlemen, is us. It's all happening to us because it is us. It, it, they're all reminders of who we are. All we have to do is get out of our own way. And with that, Hollywood um, and Miss Harris showed a, a, a clip. I wanted to show a clip from a movie that means a lot to me. And it's, it's a movie called the, the Legend of Bagger Vance. And it's about a young man who went to war, who came back, and had lost his authentic swing. He was a golfer. But the swing, authentic, is his soul. He had lost his soul in war. Now, you don't necessarily... War doesn't necessarily make people lose their soul. I've seen what it does to young men and women. But a, a, a family tragedy, car accident, death of a family, uh, a divorce, uh, the loss of a child, any of these things could cause one to lose their authentic swing, their soul. So what I would like to do at this moment is um, play this for you. Thanks. Okay. That just may not happen. Okay. There it is. I share that with you because it's so easy to forget who we are, what we're here for. You know, I mean, we've all heard, you know, we're here for death and taxes. Okay? It couldn't be further from the truth. Now, I want to, I, I just, uh, I want to share with you some things. Um, I've shared with you the Andromeda perspective about who we are. I want you to know that Earth has been an experiment for a very, very long time. Every life form that's here has come from a different planet, different star system, in some cases even from different universe or galaxies. 
And what's happened is, is that each one of the life forms on this planet, virtually most of them, have been genetically altered to live in our ecosystem. Okay, an Earth environment, uh, E-type, is actually very rare. This is not the norm. This is a very complicated ecosystem that we live on. Many of the creatures on our world would be found in other planets, other star systems, in methane, uh, on methane planets, hydrogen planets, um, carbon, um, all different kinds of chemical components that we haven't even discovered yet that these life forms live in. But as travelers travel through space, what they'll do is they'll pick up these life forms. They will collect DNA. And then what they'll do is they'll experiment with it. They'll try to recreate these life forms, just like we are at a place of doing now. This is not new. Civilizations have been doing this forever, okay, to try to improve or to see what happens. Um, Earth, Earth is magnificent, absolutely magnificent. And um, many of the extraterrestrial races that have talked to the Andromedans have just been beside themselves at how, how bad it's gotten. They just don't understand why we, as a race, would allow any of our governments to use technology that they know is harmful to the planet. They just don't get it. Um, and like the clip said, now is the time. Now is definitely the time to make some changes. And I know you guys are. You know, I know, I know you're so dedicated that you've made the time and put the resources together to come here to hear the speakers to make the changes within yourself, to share this stuff with your friends and share the DVDs. I know that. Um, but like I said, life, these, these tapes, these DVDs have a life of their own. They go other places. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I want you to know that I am really, really proud of you. And I'm really proud of us. And I know that we have not shown our qualities as a race on this planet through our history. But I also know that when, but when the chips are down, that, that most people will stand up and they will do the right thing. I know that, and I truly feel that. And that has been my argument with the A's and my stand with the A's all along. You know, um, for those of us who are Americans, um, we are dangerously close to losing our Bill of Rights and our Constitution. Everything's been in place to wipe it away. In 2010, Secret arrangements have been made and plans and treaties have been signed to create a North American Union. This is supposed to take place in 2010. The Constitution and Bill of Rights are not part of that, those documents. Okay? Um, we have an opportunity here to create a new paradigm, a new domain of knowing. It just takes leadership. It takes foresight. It takes... Um, it's going to take the ability for you to communicate to your friends and your family when everything really, really starts to fall apart. And we're beginning to see it now. The, the world's global economy is, is having a lot of ripples, a lot of effects, a lot of changes. Um, here in the United States, we will be the first, as usual, to experience a lot of that stuff. Okay? But you're going to, ha you're going to be the leaders. You're going to be the ones that are going to stand there in your communities and say, look, this is what's been going on, this is what it is, and this is what we have to do. It's no accident that you are who you are. Okay, we've all volunteered for this. And my suggestion is the next time they ask us to do this, we really read the fine print on those contracts. Okay? Because I don't remember being this hard. I, 
I, I, I vaguely remember something about a walk in the park and. <laughs> okay. Um, we have just a few more minutes, and uh, I was wondering if anybody had any questions. Okay. If you could speak to um, death, both for us and death for the Andromedans, and where and how that ties together, perhaps. Death. In, the ter de in the terms of the soul, I mean, we're, we, we, the information that's presented here, yet we go home and we have our families and hospice and people dying, and how that ties in with the process that we're going through. I mean, you spoke of lifetimes, you spoke of reincarnation. You right. That's a great question. My understanding is that in the Andromedan culture, they have reincarnation as well. But in their culture, uh, when a soul crosses over, it has full memory of who it is when it comes back into the physical. Again, it's that law of consistency. We don't have that. And again, I, I believe that's that fine print on the contract. Um, <laughs> Reincarnation is still a fact here as well. Okay, we do have reincarnation. Where the soul goes after there's death, I don't have that answer. I don't have that answer. I've just got a quick joke. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, there you are. Yeah, it's just a quick joke. Two Androbindans. Once again, if we can stand up when we ask the question. Yes, aloha, Alex. Um, I watched your show on uh, on, the, on Google uh, UFO hypothesis, and you talk a lot about your contacts with the Andromedans. Um, have you been having contacts within the last couple of years, or anything that's been more um, recent in nature? And any messages through that? Um. For five years, I pushed them away. And the reason I did, it just got too hard. It got too hard to walk the two worlds. So I pushed them away, and I had a lot of work to do. Um, recently, though, uh, the contacts have resumed. And uh, much of it has been on a, uh, of a personal relationship. Um, the message has been more or less personal relationship, just getting to know each other once again um, after a very long time of not talking to each other. I actually got pretty pissed off with them, if you really want to know the truth. I got mad about some things that happened in my life, and I felt that they should have told me. So there you have it. Um, thank you, Alex, for everything. Aloha. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Okay, regarding the financial structures of our planet and the difference between their not needing currency, do they foresee a transition for us into that? Uh, is that any part of our the 2012 transition? What, what virtually all the other cultures do, and that's a great question, what virtually all the other cultures do is that they have a very small government and basically everything's managed by the people. Everything is provided, education, housing, Everything that you would need to live is there. In turn for that, you participate in doing uh, several years of learning how to grow food, horticulture, of managing livestock, dealing with nature, um, uh, building machinery, building uh, spacecraft, uh, learning uh, astronomy, planetary astronomy. Um, you would participate in all of those fields, and as you're participating, and you're not only getting an education, but you're also contributing, all of your needs are met. Everything is, is there. And, and each generation contributes. And it just, it just works out perfectly. It's almost like a utopian society. Nobody has to pay for anything. It just, just doesn't happen. 
Hi there. I'm right at the back. Oh. Hi. Um, I have a question for you. Um, I too have been in contact with uh, Andromedans, and uh, they've talked to me a bit about their society. And I was interesting, uh, interested to, to know if they told you uh, when it comes to uh, constructing things, have they explained to you uh, how far they go with manual construction or whether they use uh, thought manifestation, whether they combine energy with matter to construct uh, places, buildings, and things like that? Uh, actually, both. They also use holographic technology. Yeah, I thought perhaps that might be the truth. Because uh, somehow, when I've been talking to them, I couldn't envisage them getting greasy, you know, making uh, wheel bearings and things like that. So um, I was wondering what they'd said to you um, about uh, whether they get together as a group and maybe manifest a park or a garden or, or homes and things? Uh, my understanding is, is that the park areas, all of that is created using holographic technology. Um, if you're, if you're in, this, in this craft and you move into one of these park areas, you literally have no idea you're in a spaceship. Mm -hmm. And you would never know you were in a spaceship. Yeah. I mean, they could create a Hawaii in the middle of these motherships. Mm -hmm. And you would think you were in Hawaii. You would not know unless you consciously were aware that you had walked into the ship, walked upstairs, took in elevators, uh, what they call elevators, what we would call elevators, to different levels, and then walked out into the park area in the spaceship as you're traveling through space. It is the most phenomenal thing mm -hmm. I could possibly, uh, that you could possibly experience. Yeah. It's awe-inspiring. Yeah. You know, it, it's just... <laughs> And they're using their thoughts to bring that matter together as, as, and so it becomes solid in front of yes. you like a flower. Yes. yes, thank you. I... Yes, they magnetize thought. They magnetize space with their thought. There's a lot we didn't cover, and I'm out of practice. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you.